Okay. So let's talk about customer onboarding. When I picture customer onboarding and when I think about that, what comes into my mind is little pieces of UI like this. This is the entry point into Intercom sign-up form. But actually, onboarding as a concept is really broad. It encompasses all these things. How you get set up with a product, how you learn about it, and how you purchase it too. Probably everybody that's here works on software, or most people that are here. But really, all products and all industries have an onboarding experience. So we thought it would be interesting to focus on a few examples from other industries before we dive right into software. Uh, let's start by looking at an example uh, with automobiles. Here's a picture of a Ford dealership from 1956. Car dealerships are basically like the onboarding experience for cars. They're the place that you come to see the different options that are available, to try them out, to talk to somebody about them. And if we look at how this onboarding experience has changed from 1956 to today, it hasn't. Really, it's pretty much the same. It's a big black box, or a big glass box. It's full of cars. Uh, you can talk to salespeople inside, but not a lot has changed about the onboarding experience for cars. And if we look at the broader context that informs the onboarding experience for cars, we can see that that lack of change is reflected here. We have the products that they're selling. We have the environment in which they sell that product. There's the audience that they sell to and their attitudes. There's the packaging, which is like the different options that they slice products up and make available to people to choose from, and the price that they charge. Um, there's been incremental changes in these things over that time period, but no sort of massive shifts. Tesla is maybe the first car company that's actually going to actually shift this formula. OK, so let's take a look at an industry that has changed a lot in its onboarding, and that's fast food. If we go back to the 1920s, this was actually the most popular restaurant chain in the US, Horn and Hard Art, the company probably none of us had really heard of. Um, and back in the 20s, American cities were very different. The population density of a place like the Lower East Side of Manhattan was four times what it is today. So their onboarding challenge was really how to serve a huge number of customers in a relatively small space, efficiently, effectively, and well. So they came up with this restaurant concept called the Automat. And as the name implies, they automated a lot of stuff in the restaurant. There was no waiters at all. The way it worked would be, You'd walk in, go to the back wall, where there was an array of windows with different foods inside, choose the food you want, put a dime in, take it out and go back to your seat, all without any staff involvement. And these things were amazingly effective. They, the biggest one in, in New York was able to serve 10,000 people per day. Really amazing. Fast forward 50 years in this case to, the, to around the 1970s, and fast food looks completely different. It looks something like what we have today, uh, predominantly outside of city centers, places that you now drive to or even drive through. Um, so let's examine the context again and see what's caused this change. So here, there's been a, just a monumental shift in the environment uh, where, where people eat, where people live, in fact. Uh, suburbia didn't really exist in the 20s and became a thing. Car culture started to dominate. So as the environment changed, as the context changed, the onboarding had to react too. Uh, really interestingly, we're starting to see some, something of a regression in the environment, right? Cities like San Francisco have increasingly high population densities. And so it's no surprise that there's a startup called Itza who have brought back the automat. Except this time you can only buy, and this is literally true, quinoa-based healthy food. <laughs> so what about software? Uh, let's come back to the world of software and look at how do the elements of context that affect the onboarding experience affect us in the software industry. Well, we've got really all of the same categories that apply. There's the products that we sell, the environment, the audience, the packaging, and the price. And if we look across Intercom's history as a company, or in fact, the industry as a whole, actually, all of these things have changed, are changing, and change quite frequently. So you'd think with so much change going on, onboarding experiences would change a lot as well to keep pace. But actually, from what we've seen, that's not really the case. Onboarding, doesn't usually, onboarding experiences don't usually change that much. There are many reasons for this, but one that we want to talk about briefly is the decision to optimize versus redesigning. For onboarding in our industry, at least, the bias definitely seems to be towards optimizing, even when that might not be always the right decision. <clears throat> if we look at a simple model for when it makes sense to optimize versus redesign for an onboarding experience, we could look across two axes. The first one is just the change in context, all those elements that we just looked at uh, since the last time you considered your onboarding experience. Has, have things changed a lot, or have they only changed a little bit? And then the second axis is performance. Um, 
the performance of your onboarding experience? Is it meeting the expectations and goals that you have or not? So uh, in the top left, when we have good performance already and uh, it hasn't been that long, obviously this is a great time to be optimizing. You've got a strong foundation that you can build upon and continue to get incremental improvements in performance. On the other end of the spectrum, if there's been a lot of time passed, there's a ton of change in the context since the last time you examined things, things aren't performing well, obviously a case for redesigning, taking a step back and considering the constraints and opportunities in a new way, coming up with a new solution. It's the other two quadrants that are uh, maybe interesting to think about a little bit further. In the top right, you've got good performance, so it's probably appealing to just continue to optimize and try to get incremental improvements out of that experience. But the thing is that the shift in context that's occurred might actually be masking some new opportunities that could unlock some serious new potential in your onboarding experience, um, and that stuff's kind of hiding. So in other words, what used to be good performance might actually not be good performance anymore. And in the bottom left, uh, if you have something you've recently launched, but it's not performing up to your expectations, it might be appealing to try to just optimize your way incrementally from bad performance to good performance. But you may get to good performance a lot more quickly by just taking a step back and considering things again. So perhaps redesigning also is more impactful there. OK, so enough theory. Let's take a look at a concrete example from here at Intercom. So for the longest time, the core of an Intercom installation has been this snippet of JavaScript. You put this on the page. Uh, the web page or web app that you have, and you tell us some information about the currently logged in user, their name, their email, when they signed up. But actually, you've got to do a little bit of work to prepare this. So you've, you'll typically have to write, use a programming language to dig into your database, take the data out, and dump it on the page to tell us who the user is. So there's a little bit of work involved. Um, so it was pretty clear our onboarding challenge was simply help as many customers as possible to correctly install this JavaScript snippet. So in 2011, uh, Intercom still in beta, super early days, long before my time. Um, we were super proud of this awesome little JavaScript snippet, and it was right there on our marketing site. This is clearly telling us that the audience of Intercom at the time were uh, tech-savvy developers, small startups. A year later, we've got a real sign-up flow. We're no longer in beta. But it's still this same snippet of JavaScript. Fast forward to 2013, another year later, it's still there. It's been kind of spruced up, but it's exactly the same snippet. And one year later, uh, it's there again. And by this point in 2014, this idea has pretty much been optimized to death. I'm not sure if you can make it out of the back, but at the top there it says there's a, there's a tab between engineers or business people. <laughs> and if you click on business people, you just get to email your engineer. <laughs> um, then we're, like, we're giving you a bunch of hints for different languages. Uh, we're telling you to come hang out with us in, in our install chat room to cut you through this, or to watch our super simple 30 second install video. We're just doing everything possible to try and get you to install this JavaScript. So in the meantime, we're also receiving requests from existing Intercom customers about importing CSV data into Intercom. They have additional data that they want to layer on top of the users that they already have stored in Intercom. So we're like, that's great. Uh, design and build an import, a CSV importer that people can use to get uh, extra batches of data into Intercom after they sign up. The breakthrough came when we sort of realized, actually, maybe this importer could be useful for people who are signing up for Intercom and are brand new to the product. And so that kind of led to this realization of a shift in context uh, that actually needed to affect the onboarding experience in a bigger way. Our audience had changed. Uh, we had started out with really tech savvy people and kind of moved to a broader audience that was a lot less tech savvy. So it was much harder for them to install the JavaScript. So instead, we sort of needed to broaden our perspective on what the onboarding problem was and instead focus on how to get users into Intercom. So this is where we ended up with our first redesign. This is, a, this is exactly how it looked, uh, the first thing we shipped after redesigning. And for the first time, we had a, a new second possible way to get started with Intercom, import users from CSV. It's presented here as an equal, kind of an equal choice, side by side with, with our traditional JavaScript install. Um, so how did it work? It worked really tremendously well. The three months before we launched this, uh, our conversion rate from emails to signed up apps hovered around the 30% mark. We launched it in August of 2014, and the three months following, our conversion rate had risen dramatically, 15 percentage points, or 50% overall, to 45%. And I think even more incredibly, uh, we hadn't actually cannibalized the standard JavaScript install. You can see in the same months here that the traditional JS installs are slightly growing too. Um, but this green area on the bar chart here, this is a, a totally new audience who we'd been absolutely neglecting with our previous onboarding. 
our context had changed, our audience had changed, and so it was time for our onboarding to change too. But of course, redesigns have a shelf life too. All that context that changed initially and gave you the opportunity to try something new will continue to change, and so eventually you'll have to react again. Um, but in 2014, where we left off, we've just launched this. It's got good performance. This is the perfect time to optimize. We've got a solid foundation that we can build upon and a thesis to use, and so that's what we did. Um, we just added more ways for users to integrate with their product or import their users into Intercom from additional services that they might be using. But of course, this has diminishing returns over time. And so meanwhile, uh, our product team back in Dublin have been working on a brand new Intercom product called Acquire, which actually just launched last week. Uh, and Acquire is a really interesting product because it's the first way in Intercom that you can talk with logged out users, so people who aren't signed into your website or web app. And so if we go back to that original snippet I showed you guys, uh, Nikola Tesla and everything there, um, if, a, if a user signed out, we don't need to know their information in Intercom. So the snippet in this new case is much simpler. It requires no customization whatsoever. And actually, there's a profound change. A profound change has happened to our product. That's part of the context for our onboarding. So we should be thinking about what ramifications this has. So it provokes this question. What if all brand new customers start with this new highly simplified JavaScript snippet. Um, it works on any page in the entire web. It doesn't require any configuration. requires very little technical skill. And if you really need the user data, maybe you can add it later. Um, and so actually, our, our reframing from the last time of the onboarding challenge, how to get users in, into Intercom, might change again. Maybe it's how do we show new users the magic of Intercom as quickly as possible. So we're working on this behind the scenes. And We've got, some, we've got a pretty cool flow that we're going to be launching soon. So if you ask me, what has made the biggest difference at Intercom in our ability to focus proactively and successfully on the onboarding experience, what would it be? Well, by far the biggest problem that I've encountered is that it's just really difficult to hold the perspective of both new onboarding customers and existing steady state customers in your head at the same time. Plus, it's really hard to prioritize between features that target these two different audiences. So by far, in my mind, the most impactful thing that we've done at Intercom is to make the decision to have a team that can explicitly focus on onboarding customers as their top priority, while we have the other teams that can focus on other priorities. This separation and specialization extremely simplifies the prioritization process, makes everybody more focused. And of course, the boundaries between the teams are fuzzy, but they always are. We navigate them, and we continue to move forward and cooperate and work together. So at Intercom, that team that focuses on onboarding user perspective is the growth team, which we both work on. We're here in San Francisco, and we do all of those things that we talked about that uh, affect the broader onboarding experience. So I guess to leave you with, if you haven't thought about your onboarding in a while, uh, if you don't have somebody at your company to think about optimizing versus redesigning and when one or the other is appropriate, um, in short, if you don't have a team to focus on onboarding as their top priority, then maybe you should. And we're excited to talk to you about our experiences building that team right after this. Thanks. Thanks.